Well, um, thank you, Gil. Um, it's customary for people in this miserable position to say how glad I am to be here. Um, in my case, it's literally true, because I haven't been here since 1979, and I'm extremely glad to be here. It's wonderful uh, to discover that this thing which has loomed in my mind as a kind of lingering fantasy is still, in fact, standing. Of course, when you go to England, it's more miraculous if things are still standing, but that's neither here nor there. So I'm going to talk to you about this topic, the art before Noah, which has been a big adventure, which has converted my life from the dull, tedious, dusty and unexciting life of a normal curator into just the opposite with heart-endangering consequences. So one of the things that happens if you are a curator in the British Museum is, uh, because the public have the mistaken idea that we are experts, is to identify things which people bring in. And they always make a lot of fuss about uh, how interested they are when you tell them that it's Middle Bronze Age or Late Iron Age or something of this sort of technical side, because what they really want to know is how much they're worth. And <laughs> we are forbidden by the trustees from ever referring to this matter, so we are experienced in dealing with all sorts of drama. And it happened to me once when I was on duty that a person called Douglas Simmons came in in about 1985 with a bag full of antiquities, small antiquities, which he poured onto the desk, and I was the duty officer. And it contained some coins, a couple of lamps, a bit of Chinese stuff, a couple of shabtis, and a cuneiform tablet. Well, it might not surprise you to know that I picked up the cuneiform tablet first. And um, I picked it up, and at first sight I assumed it was going to be an old Babylonian letter. I'm sure you would have the same conclusion in terms of size, shape, dimension, grammatical forms, semantic parallels, and so forth. But I lifted it up and started to read it. And this is what came out. And I'm not going to read the whole of this book out. I should tell you, if you want to read it yourself, it is easily arranged. It's very easily arranged afterwards. <laughs> wall, wall, read wall, read wall. Atra Hussis, pay heed to my advice that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property and save life. Well, not many letters begin that way. And in point of fact, I was able to read it at sight because I had a very demanding teacher who used to hit people and um, thrash them with barbed wire until they learnt their signs. And so uh, recognising the beginning of the flood story in the Babylonian epic was a doddle for someone who graduated from that classroom. So I realised I had in my hands a piece of the old Babylonian version of the flood story, which is a piece of gold in the world because everyone is interested in the flood story and nobody ever gets their hands on an unpublished piece which has never been seen by any other Assyriologist. So I was rather excited about it. And what happened was he took it away, picked up the lamp and said, and what about this? And when I'd gone through the rest of the material, trembling with excitement and thinking, can I borrow this for a while and read it? He went and I didn't see him for the best part of a decade. So I knew that this thing was in circulation, and this was before the trustees of the British Museum had produced this handbook about how to um, knock people to the floor and take over their property for the trustees. So I just let him escape. But I knew that sooner or later it would come back to the British Museum because all important things do. Some of them, for example, are temporarily in the Louvre, but sooner or later they will come to us. So the thing is... Uh, when I finally got this thing into my control, I had the, le the luxury, to say, of reading it properly in privacy with a good light and, um, and so forth to get the guts of it out. And it became apparent that the thing was of 60 lines in length, and although the beginning was exactly the same as is attested in the other sporadic examples, the rest of it was very startling. Now, knowledge of the flood itself as on cuneiform tablets has been in the public domain since 1872 when George Smith, the character on the left, for the first time was a modern human being who read a piece of uh, this dog biscuit kind of material from this barbaric background and discovered that he was reading Holy Writ virtually in this peculiar format. And the story goes in our department records, I'm sure it's true, that he 
dropped the tablet on the table in his anxiety and started to run around the room, holding his head and making funny squeaking noises, and eventually attempting to remove his clothing. And this has gone down in history as a laughable matter, but it's almost certain that what actually happened was he had an epileptic fit because the impact of discovering for the first time that the text of Genesis, which everybody in 19th century London knew by heart, existed in this peculiar rival form. So George Smith, um, in 1872, discovered this for the first time. There was a huge furore about it, all sorts of discussion by all sorts of people. I'd just like to draw your attention to the image of Smith on your left. He has the broad, intelligent forehead, leadership kind of profile, fine beard, (laughs) lucid, intelligent eyes, and so forth. It's always been this range of characteristics that the trustees have looked for in their (laughs) serological employees. So the thing is that when Smith published this, uh, he wrote very lucidly about it and its implications for the biblical story because it contained not only the approximate parallel but a much more specific one. For example, the fact that when the flood was abated and, and things were quiet, a series of three birds was released and that only the third one came back. I mean, didn't come back, so he knew that uh, something had appeared above dry land, which is, of course, what Noah did in the Um, more popular version of the story as celebrated in Hollywood and the really good one which you have to read in the original in Babylonian so um, one of the interesting things about the uh, version which he discovered that 1872 tablet it came from the library of Ashurbanipal in the 7th century BC it was one of the king's own personal copies of his standard literature Um, although they didn't know that securely at the time. And when Smith made his very quick and very accurate translation, it included a description of what the ark that this um, Utnapishtim, the equivalent of Noah in his version of the story, had built. And the description comes out as a cube. That's to say an object which is um, the same height, width and length in all dimensions. So the clergymen, who were extremely worried about the way that the Bible had been undermined and what this might mean for the end of civilization, um, came back in force saying, well, this is rubbish. This isn't nothing like the ark in the Bible. I mean, it's a cube. I mean, whoever had a boat that was a cube, this is mad anyway, and we don't have to take notice of this. And so they were um, impelled and felt encouraged to dismiss evidence which was unwelcome to them. Of course, they were operating on the assumption that the real Noah's Ark, so to speak, looked like this. I was rather fortunate to find this contemporary photograph, which um, (laughs) is what we call research in the British Museum. It's called Google, generally. And uh, here it is, um, exactly as it was, uh, reconstructed in this image according to the text of the Bible. So the situation was that in 1872 and a half, there were people who believed in the Assyrian version. There were people who stuck fast to the Bible, so you had a cube or a coffin, but of course at the same time everybody really knew uh, what Noah's Ark looked like. (laughs) It's one of these things. There's usually a giraffe looking out the window just to complete it. So in fact, Ark fanciers, so to speak, had these three alternatives at their disposal. So it made it even more astonishing when I had the leisure to read this tablet when it turned out the following thing, because um, the god Enki, um, who had discovered that the world was going to be destroyed, uh, decided it wasn't a good matter and that he picked on some human being to build this lifeboat to rescue all life forms against the waters that would come. And um, it's always been a mystery, actually, why he picked on this Atram Harsis, whose name means extremely intelligent, because however intelligent he might have been, it is clear that Enki didn't trust his knowledge of boat building at all, because in this tablet he tells him all the information you need to know in order to build this boat. In other words, it's one of those, like one of those boxes from Ikea, which has all the information on a mimeographed panel on the side, so when you take it home, you can build it on your own. So the first piece of information that came out of reading this tablet was that the boat was round. 
And I'm fairly secure about most words beginning with K because I worked on the K volume, so I felt that the word kipatu was under my belt, but I thought I'd make absolutely sure that I hadn't misremembered it because round boats are not something you tend to encounter in your normal life until you remember, of course, that riverine communities all over the world have used round boats, which we called coracles, and which in Arabic are called guffa, and that in ancient Mesopotamia they certainly had boats like this, and it suddenly became a rather intelligible picture that for an old Babylonian poet who lived when he wrote that tablet in about 1800 BC, so it's a thousand years older than the Assyrian version, in writing about the story conceived of the ark in question, the boat to save lives, as a round coracle boat as people built on the sides of the river. And this makes a lot of sense, because the thing about a coracle, if you've never been in one, you will have to take my word for it. I've been in one once. Uh, the reason is I'm the, um, I'm the president of the British Coracle Association. <laughs> don't, it's not a funny thing at all. I don't see why you're sniggering. This is a major, major tribute to me as a person. I, am the, I, I haven't got a gold chain. It's a bit annoying, but they promised me one, and I had to go in one, so I've been in one, so I can talk about this with a great deal of familiarity. And the thing about these boats I know from many years of experience is that they don't sink. And if you've got the job of collecting up all these male and females and putting them in a boat, it doesn't have to go from Portsmouth to New York. All it has to do is float. And the coracle doesn't have a front or a back. It just floats, and they float beautifully. So that is why the poet who wrote this story, trying to visualise the thing in a realistic way, decided it was going to be a giant coracle. It certainly was going to be a giant coracle. The surface area of the plan is given, it's 3,600 square metres, so bigger than this room. And in this IKEA list of instructions, he tells him of the materials he will need, and that's to say the, um, um, the rope, which is wrapped around to build the body of the boat, the ribs made of wood, and the bitumen to coat it inside and out to make it waterproof. He not only tells him he will need these materials, but he actually tells him how much of them he will need in order to complete the job. So this is where it becomes something very remarkable. So <clears throat> this is what, of course... Iraqi coracles look like or used to look like. The one at the top on your left is a fairly modern one, one of the last ones ever made probably. And the one below that is the runner-up for the um, uh, Guinness Book of Records award for the most males um, ever stuffed in a single coracle with success. And in fact they were disqualified because one of them was a boy and they thought that was cheating. Um, so that's them. And then in the middle is a drawn from a lantern slide which was given to us in the museum by an old lady from her father's collection and we had it blown up and you can't see very clearly on this screen but you've got two women who are doing the grand tour and have clearly been persuaded by some slick um, organiser of um, holiday activities to go in one of these boats and sample life in real and they all look terrified so the thing is that the coracle in Iraq is known in ancient times, it's on the sculptures, for example, but also from many anecdotal and photographic pieces of evidence from the 19th and 20th century as well, even though I think it's now disappeared. So the other photograph which I will now show you is this, which is from a pair of lantern slide pictures and part of a sequence of someone who photographed the construction of a coracle on the banks of the river in Iraq in about 1920. And here you can see, uh, uh, in, in, in principle, how this boat is built. And what you do is you have to have all this great quantity of rope, and you have a piff, the piff which comes from the, the trunk of a palm tree, which is twisted and twisted and twisted until it becomes a thick rope, and it is exceptionally strong. And the basic way in which the coracle is to be made is you draw it out on the ground in a great circle, and as it comes back to the beginning, the next bit is laid on top of the previous one, and it is stitched north to south, and you go round and stitch north to south, and then the third on top of the second, and you end up with a great floppy basket. And when you've done that, you have to have ribs which fit round the frame, which is laced 
to the whole, and then the bitumen um, is applied. So something very interesting happened to me, probably unique situation. The central portion of this tablet is full of numbers and very technical, and I'm frantically innumerate. So I got a bit of help with dealing with the numbers, and I've never built any boats at all in London, so I wasn't really on top of it, but I discovered in the library of the Ethnographical Institute in our museum that a man called Hornell wrote in 1920 an account of how these coracles are built, of which this is an illustration by somebody else. So this Hornell was a very worthy person, a great boat historian, and he was from Scotland, and he was a man of very small number of words. His sentences are extremely terse and very difficult to understand. And the Babylonian, which is more or less preserved, is very terse and difficult to understand in different areas. So I had this unique situation that I used Hornell's description from 1920 AD to understand the narrative written in the 18th century BC about how to build these boats and at the same time use the Babylonian to understand what he meant in English. And eventually both things became mutually intelligible and the whole sequence emerged. So I'm not going to go through all this in laborious detail. It was tempting to do this and then perhaps suggest over wine there might be a short paper of test questions for you all to fill out. But there is one thing I want you to retain from this experience, Brad, though it may be for many years to come. The measurements of the materials are, of course, given in Babylonian measurements, not in English. They weren't that advanced. So when it came to the rope needed to wind round to make this boat, this god Enki explained to Atrahasis that he would need 14,430 sutu measures of rope in order to build this boat. I thought this was supposed to be the Oriental Institute. Uh, Someone was supposed to go, or something like that. I'm rather disappointed. Okay, let me tell you another amazing fact. I decided I couldn't cope with the maths on this tablet, so I did what people in my position normally do, which is look in the yellow pages for a cheap Nobel Prize winner in mathematics. And I got this fellow to come over, and I explained that we had these measurements, uh, that the rope length was given at 14,430 sutu, and we knew that the area of the boat was 3,600 square metres and that the walls are seven metres high. And we also knew that traditionally to build these boats, the rope is about a finger thick, half a finger thick. So we have, in other words, all the dimensions available for a mathematical genius to work out if we were going to build this boat of this size using this material, how much we would really need. Are you with me? Yes. Superb. <laughs> I'll just refresh your memory. The... Divine instructions specify 14,430 sutu. And this mathematician... Thanks. (laughs) Extra wine afterwards. So, this mathematician, and he did it several times, I used to do it several times and get it wrong each time, but this guy got it right each time. It was rather interesting. When he calculated what we would actually need using a whole bunch of mathematical theorems, which are incredibly bewildering to me, it came out at 14,624 sutu. (laughs) In other words, 527 kilometres. So if this were England, I would say this rope goes exactly from London to Edinburgh, (laughs) and the difference between the specified measure from heaven and the calculated measure worked out by a mathematician is less than the distance from London to Watford. Or to put it in American terms, Chicago to um, Minnesota and Chicago to Minnesota minus about 32 sutu. You can work that out for yourselves. (laughs) But the point about it is that the difference is, A, minimal given the length, and secondly, cannot be coincidence. So one is forced to to, forced to accept that embedded in this poetic narrative, the data 
which was given, as it were, from heaven, as it were, to man to use, was realistic and predicated on real boat building. This is a very remarkable thing. And it's also remarkable to note that people who made these boats by the side of the river did the same thing from 1800 BC to the middle of the 20th century AD, meaning that the coracle is a perfect construction. It never needed improvement. It never needed adjustment. Once it had come into being, it just went on in the world. Also interesting. So something funny happened to me. I'm sitting on top of this stuff. It's full of amazing excitement. It turns out there's no narrative. It's just speeches, one person to another, unlike any other Mesopotamian text. It turns out that the animals went in two by two, which we knew from the Bible, not from Cuneiform, and a million other really marvellous things. So I'm having a lot of excitement about this. And a lady comes in who works for the Guardian newspaper about three weeks before Christmas and says to me... "Um, Anything new in the tabs business, which is the way journalists talk in Britain, uh, nothing special except that um, I've got the blueprint for how the Babylonians built their ark in the old Babylonian period. Oh, really? And so she asked me all sorts of questions. And just before Christmas, this came out in the newspaper. <laughs> Well, this had other consequences than mere laughter, I can tell you. I had a large number of phone calls, mostly from this country, from television producers (coughs) who said, we got to make a movie, (laughs) like that. And sometimes they called it a documentary. If they knew the full word, I'm not sure. Anyway, this trustee's manual I explained to you about before has taught all curators to have nothing to do with documentary makers because um, documentary makers all tell lies. And it's always been our policy to suck with a very long spoon when it comes to anything to do with being in a documentary film, especially if it's something to do with the Bible. Because what happens is they make a recording and they go away and in the editing process they miss out certain words. Like not. (laughs) And so you find yourself on stage talking stuff which is diametrically opposed to what you either said or what you believe. So we're all a bit sceptical about these things. But it turned out in the end that a rather interesting person approached me and said, we've got to do a documentary about this. He was an Englishman, which helped. And um, I said, I'm prepared to do this. It would be an adventure because what he wanted to do was to build this boat on the basis of the data, because the data made everybody think, well, you could build this boat. So we thought, why don't they do it? They're rather clever in that kind of way. So all they had to do was raise $100 million, and we would do it. So I said, I'm happy to do this, only um, I'd like this to be one of those documentaries, unusual documentary, where um, we tell the truth about everything. Tell the truth. Kind of long silence. Hello? What? What? I don't think any of my colleagues has ever had that idea before. What an interesting conception to work with. And I wanted to be all over this film and to run it. I wanted to do the score, the lyrics, <laughs> not to mention the film angles, everything about it. I had this documentary in my head. You know, it would have been a masterpiece. But actually, when it started, they kept me down in the most depressing way. So they got the money together and they decided... We couldn't build it in Iraq for obvious reasons, and after a lot of time and investigation, they settled on building it in India, in southwest India, in the state of Kerala. And they found a lake and a shipyard they could hire, and the um, palm trees that provided the rope were there, and um, all other sorts of materials were there, and it was Iraqish in appearance, so to speak. You know, it had that kind of look about it. So um, they got together a very serious team of um, the three um, ancient boat builders and a team of workmen, and for four or five months in India they built this boat. So um, what actually happened was this, that when I realised that my translation, which was all done in the humility of being a normal Assyriologist and no, nobody's head is on the block or anything like this. I suddenly wake up one day to discover there's going to be this multi, multi million dollar operation the other side of the world with people following my every word as if it's gospel. So, of course, I worked on everything a hundred and hundred times. Woke up in the middle of the night thinking that 
actually I got it wrong, it's actually designed for a double-decker bus or something terrible like that. And it was a very nerve-wracking thing, especially when I sent the translation with the dimensions to India and, and, and the guy in charge of it had to be hospitalised when he read how big the thing was. And uh, We had a long interlude before it was agreed the following thing, that if they couldn't build it full size, they would build it as big as they possibly could in accordance with the dimensions given by the original measurements. And, as you will see, uh, the second part of this lecture, uh, sometime after 10 o'clock, that the, um, <laughs> the, um, the impossibility of building it full size was, in fact, perfectly reasonable. So they, that was the compromise. It was reached, and I also said, actually, they sent an email. It was rather, rather smart. This email came saying, would, would you mind terribly if... Yeah, we've done this on the computer, and the wood, it, it, it wouldn't sustain itself. We can't, would you mind if we, so I, instead of being like a normal person, which, which is to write back and say, chaps, you know, it's marvellous that you're doing this, and whatever you have to do is fine, you know, it's absolutely, you know, how could I ever, I let the thing go for four or five days. And then I sort of said, no, okay, if you must. Like that, you know, to kind of, okay, just this once. We're building a boat, just this once, you want to make it small? Okay, fine. And I discovered afterwards that was a brilliant piece of strategy. Remember this if you're ever in the process of making a documentary film with other people. That's the way to do it. Go out of your way to be a bust. <laughs> so I've got marvellous, marvellous images which were taken when this boat was being built. Really fantastic photographs. And I brought you um, only a few to give you an idea. But here you can see the chaps um, who are starting to coil the material which is already in this very thick snake-like rope at the very beginning of the process of making the bottom, which they will then go round and round and round until they've got the whole boat. And... Um, <laughs> This is a view from the, the very bottom underneath when they first started it. And the thing is, they calculated very rapidly that the thing, when it was finished, would be exceptionally heavy. And they could, once it was completed and the bottom was finished, they could never drag it along the ground as you would with a lifeboat because the, the structure wouldn't withstand it. So the whole thing had to be built on a cradle above the ground so that the whole thing can be bodily brought into the water when it came to the time for the launch. So this gives you an idea from the bottom how it looks. The tight uh, structure laced together and tied and everything was done with, with ropes and things without any glue or nails or anything. It was, everything was tightened and tightened. It was the most extraordinary construction. And um, this was a very important member of the team Actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to bring this elephant back to London because um, something happened to me once when I was a young curator. I came out of the doors of my department into the gallery and there were two uh, middle-aged American tourists and one of them said, oh, do you work here? And I said, yes. And he said, my wife and I, we were asking ourselves... How can it be uh, that the, the doors here are so tall? Because um, the doors to my department are about the whole size of this wooden panelling... Um, double doors, and all the museum doors are built on this scale. And some devil came into my mind, I don't know what made me say this, but I just said, oh, well, this goes back to the time of the British Raj, because in those days, the keepers of the departments used to come to work on elephants. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, that's really interesting. And I had to run after them up the gallery and say, no, it's not true at all. So I thought... So these are the chaps at work. Um, they had these primitive tools, so to speak, and they sang when they were working, and it was, was marvellous. And eventually, as the boat took shape, this was a view of the inside. And you, it was very beautiful inside. It was extraordinary. It was sort of handcrafted, and it smelled of wood. And you can see, perhaps that these are the, the great ribs which come down and meet in the middle to make the floor, and they go all the way up here to the top. And uh, this, these are the walls made of the rope, which is lashed to the ribs on the inside. And then on these um, struts coming down of the ribs into the middle, they laid these um, big circular woods with these uh, uh, stanchions, 
which supported the upper deck, because in the tablet it's described that um, how many there are of them and how long they are. These stanchions were, were posed so that the upper deck could be installed because the human beings were going to be upstairs and all the animals downstairs. And they explained in the text that the, the house is to be built on the upper deck for uh, Atram Hassis and his immediate family, and it was made by the verb of tying. So it wasn't made of wood, it was made out of um, reeds, as I will show you in a moment. So this is what the inside of it looked like. And you know, people who, who, who find out about this have two very interesting questions. Um, the, the most burning question that I've ever been asked, because I had to talk about this for, periodically at literary festivals and other rooms full of unknown individuals, and um, usually somebody uh, asks me afterwards, what do they do with the dung? And uh, it doesn't say in the tablet what they did with the dung. <laughs> so if anybody's anxious about it, I'm really sorry, but I don't know either. But um, the interesting thing is that the, this, this is built literally like a wedding cake from a recipe. And this structure is how the Babylonian tablet conveyed the idea of it. And theoretically, the stanchions could have had partitions between them in which species could have been kept separate if, for example, you're going to do that. If you write a book about Noah's Ark, this is another health warning I should impart to you, um, you do get into hot water because um, lots of people believe in it, of course, and lots of people have very serious questions like, wouldn't it sink with all the animals? And the, um, it's an interesting thing, this. Lots of discussions of this on the internet, which are absolutely insane in every other particular, discuss how difficult it will be to have a boat with all these heavy animals in. But the point is that when the Babylonians said all the animals, they meant all the animals that they knew. They didn't mean all the animals they'd seen on television. They meant the animals that they knew. And it's the same in the Bible. They meant the animals that were familiar to them. They were wild animals and domestic animals. And, in fact, the list isn't so great. I worked it out what the list was. It isn't so huge, and it's not so mad as if you have all the heavy things and all the gnats sort of sitting together and the one squashing the other and so forth. Anyway. Now... When they built this boat in Babylonia, if they did really build it, they had the world's best quality bitumen in abundance because it bubbles out of the ground like a spring and has been used for waterproofing since the beginning of time. And when Iraqi bitumen is applied to a boat or a wall or some other material, when it goes hard, it is impermeable, and if you renew it now and again, it will last forever. And we were expecting to get a tanker full of Iraqi bitumen brought to India to do this job. And the careful exercise of discipline about cultural property in Iraq included carcinogenic petroleum kind of productions. They would not allow a single drop of Iraqi bitumen to leave the country. So at the last minute, we had to get Indian bitumen. Uh, this is not something I would recommend. Um, I hate to say this, but it's on the black market, which means uh, there's no quality control. And the thing about Indian bitumen is this, that whatever you do with it, it comes off. So these poor blokes in an unbelievably unpleasant environment, extremely hot, were constantly applying this stuff and patching it and applying it to try and coat it entirely in bitumen. And it was a much more... Um, uh, exhausting and, and unpleasant task than it would ever have been in antiquity. So this here is a photograph which shows my dear colleagues and I have to get this right. Um, the guy in the, chat, in the hat is a, a man called Tom Vosmer and he is the kind of grand old man of, 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 archi architectural, of archaeological boat reconstruction. And then, if I get this correct... Eric is the one in the dark blue shirt, who is his best student, and Alessandro is his other best student. And Alessandro lived on this site for about four months with the workmen and ran everything. And this is me, obviously, with them um, when it was ready to launch. So I told you I wanted to run this film from beginning to end, and they wouldn't let me anywhere near it. And they actually only allowed me to go out for the last two days before the launch. So... The house which they built, in accordance with what I mentioned before about it being tied, 
is an imitation of such houses which used to um, exist in the marshes of Iraq a long time ago. And uh, they, they copied um, one of those houses to be in the spirit of the thing for, um, to represent that part. So they left half the floor open, as you can see, so that it could be filmed and everything. And you can see also perhaps the ribs that come up at the top. That's where they all finish, and there's a kind of binding round, round, round the top. And it was marvellous. So one of the things that I said... So once, once in a while, you see, they took me for lunch. So I thought, oh, this is my chance to influence this documentary for good. I've got these terrific ideas. So one, one idea was this, that you cannot really have a documentary about the art without animals in it. And we had to have animals in it, I said. Animals. You know, street value, credibility, animals and things. And I, I had this idea for myself. <laughs> You, you, know, you know the Hitchcock thing, there's a kind of vignette for a moment when the distinguished profile is visible on the screen for those who knew. So my idea was to dress up in a sheet and wear sandals and let my hair down and thwack one of these rhinos on the buttock so they would go up the gangplank. This was, I thought that would be enough for me, that would be a <laughs> heroic moment. And they said no. So then I said, well, look, I have a better idea. In India, there are many um, cults in the villages where uh, things are made of papier-mâché and painted with great realism, especially tigers and elephants and snakes. They know what they look like. And we could, we could get them to make two of each, and they could go on the boat. And if the boat sinks, well, that's what things usually do in the ritual, so no one would mind about it. And if it didn't sink, it would be a miracle. So what's wrong with that? No, they said. So I gave up. Now... When I went to India, as I say, it was for the last couple of days. And I have to tell you, two things happened which it's difficult for me to explain clearly in English because it, it was so overpowering. One of them was this, that um, when the boat was ready to... Well, let me show you a picture of it. Hold on. When I got there, the boat was ready to launch... And the plan was, in this film, they would do the following thing. It was all leafy and grown over so that no one could see the site. It was supposed to be uh, 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 so no one could spy on what was going on. So it was lots of vegetation. And this was the plan that the, 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 um, the, the director said to me, was that I had to walk um, through this jungle into the clearing where the boat was in a casual interesting, fascinating way and then when I saw the boat I had to register amazement and delight so if an actor this sort of thing is a doddle of course but you know you've got to walk right on television you can't just walk you know left leg, right leg stuff no, there's a whole way so it has to be a kind of nonchalant studied intellectually stimulating sort of walk <laughs> So I get there telling myself, I've got to be excited and delighted. What was it? Or delighted and inside. What was it? What was it? I'm thinking, and I can only do it once. And as I was walking along, this great metal construction with a camera lens was going backwards through the mud, focusing on me from about two inches away so that my feelings would be recorded for posterity because I could only do it once. So this is very difficult, (laughs) sort of uh, uh, like this through the clearing, turn the corner, and I see this boat. This is not a very dramatic photograph of it. But when I saw this boat, it was unbelievably (laughs) exciting and marvellous because this thing was a beautiful boat, a ship, a she, a definite she. It was black and sombre, and it looked like an antiquity. It didn't look like it had just been built. And it was all there from this stupid bit of clay in the British Museum, the other side of the world, come into existence. So it was impossible to simulate reaction. It was all I could do not to burst into tears. It was unbelievably marvellous for me. And that's one thing that happened. And then the other thing was this, (laughs) about these animals. When the boat was ready to go, this is how it was. They got this lake, a special lake in India, where there was, of course, no tide and no depth and no danger, where they were going to launch the boat. And there was a lot of talk about whether it would float or not. Now, as the water was not very deep, 
And as all the materials from which the boat was made would themselves float anyway, I thought that the chances of it sinking were slim. But it was poised on the edge of this lake, and in, in front of it there was a sea of mud like a rugby pitch. And they got this photographer with a cine camera on a tripod. And just before the ritual of launching the boat, the leaves parted again and these old men came out, two of them with goats on strings. You know that way the dog walkers work, um, on, certainly in Manhattan you see them with seven dogs on one. and seven, I don't know what they do when they defecate, I have no idea. But anyway, like the dog walkers, they came out with these goats and they planted a stake for one of them and a stake for the other. And I suddenly realised what this meant, that the director... I thought of a cheap way of doing the animals, right? So what he was going to do was he was going to have two goats, one male and one female, in the lens, so that when it was broadcast and people were on their sofas watching, they would imagine all the animal kingdom behind them, okay? It's the really cheap version. So what happened was this. These two parties of goats up to their ankles in mud, decided that headbutting was a lot more interesting than being a movie star, and after a while they decided that sexual intercourse was even more interesting, <laughs> and they had to pay these blokes a lot of money to disentangle this heaving mass of beasts and get rid of them so that we could launch the boat. But I thought that was a good bit of sweet revenge. That's the goat, or one of them. So this is, what the, this is what the coracle looked like when it was nearly ready to go. Um, and you can see that they uh, built it on a kind of stand. And the stand itself, they had to get that into the water. And they had a very brilliant way of doing it. They um, got hold of some local Indian um, giant coracle launchers who did this sort of stuff on a regular basis. And they had these sausages of, of um, rubber which could be laid under the structure in parallel, like sausages on a grid, and then inflated so that it became fully round. And then, like wheels, they would act as rollers, and the thing could gradually be gradually go into the water. So this is what it looked like close up. Um, the really intrepid and heavily insured crew members were on board, and the rest of us had to stand back, and these are two of these um, people who have never heard of the expression health and safety. It's marvellous to meet people who've never heard of the word health and safety. So gradually moving the thing into the water, and eventually it went into the water, and that's what it looked like. So exactly what a nice noise. So look, the thing is this. A real coral would be about that big. I mean, a normal, a normal functional coracle in, 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 in Iraqi waters. So that gives you an idea it's slightly bigger than normal. And the interesting thing was that one of the cooks had given us all sandwiches in case we were never seen again. And we put the sandwiches in this little house while we all got on with walking around and leaning over the side and making noises. And when we went to have a sandwich, there were millions of ants on them. So this is the truth about the flood and the ark that the one species you don't have to worry about is <laughs> ants. <laughs> so, uh, because of the bitumen, there was a bit of a problem with a bit of a leak. And in fact, some journalists made sardonic remarks about leaks and um, unfair statements about leaks, in point of fact. My argument is, if you've ever been in a rowing boat, there's always water in the bottom, so... Wouldn't you expect it with the world's largest coracle? I thought that was perfectly reasonable. But actually, the water started coming in rather fast, and they had to get a couple of fellows with pumps to pump. Um, but it was because of the bitumen. If it had had Iraqi bitumen, we could have gone all around the world. That's a very odd thing to be in a round coracle of that size. You probably never will, but it's very remarkable because there is no wake. So when the boat goes through the water, the prow of a boat always leaves that shimmery kind of triangle thing, which you, you know must be there with the boat. So when you're in a boat when there isn't one, it's very odd. It's like someone who would have a shadow 
who doesn't have a shadow. It's most peculiar. Anyway, they did lots of filming of it for the documentary, and then in the end it was necessary to tow this boat out of the lake down one of the canal networks that comes into it and park it somewhere, or as we say in coracle circles, berth it. And here you can see the triumphant uh, crew all wearing um, orange inflatable body sealing anti-drowning devices. Um, So we all walked about like this. Um, And it was hot enough, hardly hot enough to exist in any way. And these things insulated you from head to groin. It was really a kind of torture. So this is the interesting thing that happened. After all this is done... uh, Actually, there's something I wanted to tell you. I forgot. Hold on a moment. Yeah, something important. You see there are clouds in the sky. Now, the fact that they built this thing in secret was not, was not an accident. They had sworn all the workmen to secrecy because they didn't want tourists coming and getting hurt. And half the tourists were Hindu and half were Muslim and they worked together for many years on many projects and they faithfully did not tell anybody about it so on the day of the launch the sky had these immensely threatening storm clouds and everybody thought this was my doing and this became clear because when the work was finished um, the workmen all wanted to be photographed next to me so they were, I don't know, there were 40 or 50 of them, and they were all different sizes and dimensions. So it was a sort of up here, and then it was a down here, and all the variations of it, all next to these chaps, one by one. And when we were going home on the plane, I said to one of the film crew, you know, I was very touched by that display at the end of the, of the whole operation. They'd been working for so many months, and they were so friendly to me and so warm. And I said, you know, I'm used to being a tremendous social success wherever I go, but I did think that was a bit surprising. And uh, this guy said, well, there's nothing about that at all surprising. He said, they all thought you were a descendant of Noah. (laughs) So the thing is this. We're going home at dusk. And you can see up the sides of this canal these boats for tourists where people go for the day or for a few days' excursion and they sit on deck drinking gin from dawn to dusk. So by dusk they're usually fairly lubricated. And as we went past all these boats, person after person called out, Look, there's Noah's Ark! (laughs) And I thought... Could anything be more annoying that we spend half a million dollars to build something which is totally unlike Noah's Ark in any way whatsoever by a load of drunks is immediately recognisable? I mean, how infuriating is that? So look, if you fly over it, now you would never connect that with Noah's Ark, would you? You wouldn't think for a moment of Noah's Ark, but they all had this low view of it and they immediately recognised it. So that's a kind of weird thing. But then it made me think, because these boats that we have in nurseries, that shape, where does it come from? Because all the paintings that we have, like of the Tower of Babel and so forth, all come from the text of Genesis. The the, the material of the artists, all the famous artists who did the Tower of Babel faithfully tried to follow what's in the Bible. So why did nobody ever paint Noah's Ark like it's described in the Bible? Why is it always this kind of boat? And it occurred to me, the vague possibility, that in point of fact, that the boats that you see, this shape, are in fact the profile of a round boat and maybe some echo of this tradition survived beyond this tablet because otherwise it's unintelligible. Anyway, in the end, we had to moor it um, by this small canal out of the the way of the world and in good um, Nelson tradition, I was the last man off. It was a hell of a wrench to leave that boat there and the plan was to try and find someone to take it over, but that's an altogether another story. So the film was made, the film was shown, and etc., um, etc. Et and 
in the first flush of excitement, I was taken aback to find this uh, newspaper. Um, Actually, there are, these newspapers have even more startling things than that. But um, that's pretty good, I think. Anyway, um, of course, I knew, I knew they were wrong. And the reason I knew they were wrong was because we have um, the proof in the British Museum. You see, we have this old map of the world, which was drawn in about 600 BC, probably in Babylon. And this map of the world has been in the museum since about 1878. It's a very well-known thing. It's published all over the place. But for those people who are interested in this art story, it's a corker of a thing. So you will see, with the aid of this modern, sophisticated computer diagram, which is pretty good going for the British Museum, that you have a circle with a ring of water around it. And the water is described as uh, bitter water. It's a river. And inside this disk represents the Mesopotamian heartland. And it is interesting that conceptually they thought it was round, acting on the assumption that if they didn't think it was round, they wouldn't have drawn it as round. So here we have the Euphrates River, and this is the Persian Gulf, and this is Babylon straddling the Euphrates, and there are these various uh, circles with the inscriptions in, which are mostly towns in Iraq or sometimes tribal names. And so this is a kind of rough map of Mesopotamia. There are lots of people who have written about it saying it's not accurate, you know, and it's inaccurate. And we tried to use it on our motoring holiday and we got lost, as if the thing was meant to be accurate in the first place. In fact, it wasn't, because the interesting thing for these people is these triangles which are drawn off the perimeter, the outer perimeter of the river. And these are considered to be islands or mountains which are on the rim of the world and there are in fact eight of them and this text on the other side when it was complete there is a rule in the seriology that the more interesting a document the more damaged it is this is a prime specimen but there are eight sections here in which what is to be found on those remote islands is described and they are like something out of um, Greek, Greek narrative. There's a tree that has jewels on it. There are birds that don't fly. There are th- extraordinary travellers' tales type inventions. And on this one here, um, it says if you, row across the, you go across the river and you climb the mountain, you go the distance across the river, you go up the mountain, you will see something whose wooden blocks are as thick as a parsic to. Now... The thing is this, in this Atrahasis tablet, when Enki is telling Atrahasis to build the ark, each time he has done one of the tasks, he says to Enki, I have done what you asked me. And when he cut the ribs, he said, I have cut the ribs as thick as a parsiktu. Now, a parsiktu is a volume measurement and not a length measurement. So this means, as far as I can see, that to say something as thick as a parsiktu is a kind of expression in Babylonian, like you might say, um, as thick as two short planks, or as thick as a barrel, because two short planks can be of any thickness. It doesn't really matter. It's a kind of image. And the thing is that this expression, thick as a parsiktu, occurs only on this map and on the arc tablet. So it is my contention that what this refers to is the ribs of the boat outlined against the sky, and if you climb this remote mountain, you will see the remains of Atrahasis' ark landing on the mountain. Well, this in itself is not surprising, because Noah's ark lands on a mountain, and so in George Smith's tablet, a thousand years after my one, so to speak, also landed on a mountain. So that's what tended to happen to arcs in general. Here, however, we have a map which tells us which one it was. Now, the really cute thing is that we can identify now that it's this one here. Now, this is where it gets really whistly. Because you will see here 
that the part of the known world which is in the same direction as this mountain is labelled as Urartu. It's Armenia. It's the name of Armenia where there were people who were very troublesome to the Assyrians, the Armenians, and they called their area, area Urartu or Urashtu. And so this map tells you that if you cross this river, you see this mountain, here you see the ribs of the boat. When you come back, the first place you land in is Urartu. Well, in my opinion, this is the explanation for the narrative in the Bible where Noah's Ark is supposed to land on Mount Ararat. Not on Mount Ararat. In fact, it is landing among the mountains of Ararat. It is not, it, it, the Hebrew is unambiguous. That Noah's Ark landed among the mountains of Ararat. So, in other words, a district. And I believe that, as I tried to explain in detail in this book, that the traditional idea that the story in Genesis derives from a Babylonian forerunner also adopted with it the tradition about where this thing landed. But for the Judeans, they no more knew where Uratu was than anywhere else. And they certainly didn't twig the idea that the Babylonian conception was that you go beyond the river beyond the edge of the world to a district where no man ever goes and comes home again. But this word, in the same geographical location as this mountain, is surely the origin of the expression in the Hebrew Bible. So I thought that was kind of neat. And then life intervened to teach me a lesson. Um, the Easter before last, I and my family went off on the Sunday for a day trip and we passed this sign which said very old church so we all like going to old churches so we went and drove up and went in and there was a lynch gate and then the very ancient church behind it and as it was Easter Sunday it wasn't clear whether there was a service going on so I stood at the door, the big door you can see here to try and listen through the gap so we wouldn't burst in and disturb everybody. And as I was crouching there listening, there was a kind of plop on the back of my head. And I looked up, and there on the roof, up there, where is he? Oh, it's up there, sorry. There was a bird. Now, the thing is this. There was no bird ship on the ground at all. <laughs> this was not a bird toilet and the bird there was a pure white dove so I had oh there it is, it is up there there, it's a pure white dove and the floor beneath was spotless I mean any detective would immediately examine the terrain to see whether there was prior use there was none so I can only conclude that that bird came to get me <laughs> and all I can say is I have a pretty good idea who might have sent it. Thank you. <laughs>